Look, baby! Look what I got! <laughs> I bought my dragon book. Um, I was thinking maybe I could show it to you? That wouldn't be too, I don't know, cringe. Yeah. It's cool, honest. Honest, honest. Okay. Look, see, it has all this stuff like, um, look right here. Yeah, let's see what this says. What? Let me show you. I'll show you everything. <laughs> this book is really cool. There's so much stuff in it. <laughs> it's just... I'm so, it's so cool I get to show you this. Hold on. I, I get ahead of myself. Okay. Here we go. Um... To whom it may concern, Dragonology is the proper study of the of, of the dragonologist <laughs> if I can read or student of dragon lore since the occasion when Merlin found two mighty dragons fighting each other beneath the castle of King oh, I can't read this font for Liguru <laughs> I don't know <laughs> it's it's so hard to tell how you're supposed to pronounce things from the uh from the freaking, uh, like the word. You know, like when I was a kid, <laughs> I thought cafe was pronounced cave <laughs> for the longest time. <laughs> I don't know how, that, I don't know how I managed to live so long and not realize it was cafe. But no, it, <laughs> it's, it's, it's not cave, it's cafe. That one's is that French or it's, I don't know. I think it's French. Don't quote me on that. I don't. I don't know about language. I know about dragons. <laughs> Dragonology has been the study of magicians and students of the arcane sciences the world over. Knowledge of dragons has been passed down over the years. Their history, their different types, their true sightings of dragons, where they may be found, how they may be tamed or slain and how and why the student may learn to use them and the various parts to his advantage. Perhaps the most important thing is why such knowledge should never be used against them, and above all, that dragons, like so much of the flora and fauna of this fleeting world of ours, are rare indeed. It would be a shame to see them disappear forever. That would be sad. So I have set this knowledge down. Student dragonologist, not that you might seek out and destroy the few dragons that remain, but that you might learn about them, and, indeed, help them to stay concealed, for the wise learn much, see much, know much, but disturb little. I have lived among dragons, but my life is almost over, and my final accomplishment as a dragon, dragon master is to pass on this knowledge to someone worthy of its keeping. Yay! What do you think, baby? <laughs> are we are we worthy of the keeping of the knowledge? I don't know. So that was wait, I'm trying to remember. Was it where's it from? Sorry. <laughs> okay, open it. Open. Thank you. That was Yeah, that was from Ernest Drake. Okay, I was just trying to remember who Ernest Drake is. Because here's right here. It has his library card. Like, uh, yeah. Okay. Here we go. Here's the forward. Of all natural sciences, dragonology is perhaps the most rewarding, and being at the same time some, um, sorry, <laughs> I'm too excited to read, I keep skipping over words, being at the same time one of the oldest and least researched, 
Dragons have been studied since mankind's earliest days, and yet, paradoxically, they are one of the least known of Earth's creatures. So, while many scientists believe that the vast majority of the world's flora and fauna are now understood, the little-known field of dragonology, the way lies open for exciting new discoveries. Honestly, anyone who thinks that we understand everything about a subject is probably wrong. I feel like there's always more to learn in every department. I, 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 I'm wary of people who say they know everything. <laughs> Uh, it says here, right next to the picture, with time and patience, it is possible to build up a bond of trust. There's a little difference between male and female dragons. See chapter three. So, refuting skeptics. As dragonologists, we must be prepared to refute those who claim that dragons are unreal. Consider how many creatures they may, there may be that are still unknown to accepted science. When our scientists first heard of the duck-billed platypus in 1797, they laughed. How could an egg-laying mammal with a duck's beak and webbed feet exist? Even when shown physical evidence, they cried fraud. Yet by 1884, even the most skeptical had changed their opinion. Recently, Henry Stanley learned of another apparently mythical animal, the okapi. While searching for Dr. Livingstone with a giraffe's horns and a zebra's legs, it has so intrigued scientists that they are determined to find one. Yet there is no, not one who is willing to mount an expedition to bring dragons the scientific attention they deserve. That's sad. <laughs> And then here's the... How do you say that? I forget. Okapi? Okapi? I don't know. There he is. There's the platypus. <laughs> He's Perry. Perry the platypus. All scientific dragonologists must draw the conclusion, having read the work of Charles Darwin in his Origin of Species, of 1859, the dragons, like all creatures, have evolved so as to best exploit the habits, habitats in which they live. Noble in form and majestic in flight, dragons have evolved in viable natural abilities. One wonders if mankind, through effort or science, may one day be able to imitate some of them. <laughs> Man, it'd be really cool if we could just evolve to have wings or something. That'd be epic. Some argue that dragons cannot have four legs and two wings because no known vertebrate has more than four appendages, as can be seen in the above diagram. The evolution of a four-legged dragon with wings provides clear proof of Darwin's hypothesis of animal evolution through a fortuitous genetic mutation. One hypothesis just no, that's <laughs> one hypothesis. Hypothesis. <laughs> One hypothesis suggests that dragons breathe fire as a result of generating methane gas in their stomachs, a gas that also enables them to float like balloons. In fact, the dragon's head evolved, so also did the fangs and venom producing organs that are actually responsible for creating the dragon's fiery breath. And then. Dragons and legend. Among all the kinds of serpents, there are none comparable to the dragon, or that affordeth and yieldeth so much plentiful matter in history for the ample discovery of the nature thereof. The student will do very well to heed these words of the natural philosopher and dragonologist Edward Topsell in his 1607 book, The History of Four-Footed Beasts. For while there is little in dragon legend that is perfectly true, there is also little that is entirely false, and the student should seek the information from any other available source with an entirely open mind. An example of foresight, a flame a flame proof cloak may prove invaluable. <laughs> Man, I need one of those. 
can you just like walk into a fire with I mean maybe I shouldn't test it <laughs> where does one get a flame proof cloak this sounds like something you don't sell at Walmart <laughs> I'm not gonna lie I don't think you can find one of those at Walmart the five F's of Dragonology. Fieldwork. It is best by far to study dragons in their own environments. Foresight. Proper learning and preparations are absolutely essential. Forwardness. The student must be both daring and truly courageous. And frankness. One must simply report honestly what one sees at all times. And fatalities. Unless these are avoided, the student will make little progress. Yeah, I'm not sure how well you can progress if you just up and die. <laughs> I'm like, oh, you failed your class, and you failed your Dragonology class. Because you died. <laughs> I think that'd be my least, that would be the least of my, I can't talk, sorry. I'm hyped up about this <laughs> to think straight uh, <laughs> I think that if I died it would be the least of my worries for once in my life <laughs> but who knows <laughs> or I could pull a Hermione we could be killed or worse expelled <laughs> I don't know I can't really learn any more stuff if I'm dead. Can I? I don't know how being dead works. I guess I could learn how being dead works at the very least. But I get to take this book with me though. This is a cool book. Anyway. Here we have this epic map. Look, look. It's so cool. See all the dragons everywhere. Uh, look at, I'm gonna look at like the the, the fully thingies first um dragons are indigenous to almost all parts of the world so the student will never be faced with having to move thousands of miles to study them this map shows the main locations of the primary species yeah let's go i like traveling though there's nothing like going somewhere that you haven't been before you know traveling is fun i like traveling i i would love I would love to have be like, man, I gotta go, I gotta go to like, to like Hawaii or something for work. Oh, boo-hoo. Oh, boo-hoo. <laughs> yeah, I gotta go, you know, stay at the beach house. It's gonna suck. I hate traveling for work. I just want to stay home. <laughs> no, it'd be even better if my boss like paid for the airplane ticket. In the hotel, at that point, at that point, it would, it wouldn't even, I, it would be great. That's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> Note on sea serpents: the sea serpent, be it a variation of leviathan, ooh, leviathan, giant squid, or whale, has often been called the dragon of the sea. However, it seems likely that the evolution of these creatures is entirely different from that of true dragons. The sea charts of the cartographer uh, oh, Laos, uh, Laos, uh, Laos, <laughs> I don't think that last one said. Elias, uh, Elias, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> names, am I right? Magnus are considered the best for locating the sea lanes where they most often lurk, lying to wait for their storm-tossed prey. How to tell the difference? Right here. Serpents do not breathe fire, cannot fly, found in the sea, attracted to wooden ships, do not hoard treasure. Dragons may breathe fire. They can fly, they're found inland or flying over sea, they're attracted to treasure, and they hoard treasure. <laughs> just like me, I hoard treasure. <laughs> I just hoard junk, honestly. And here is the, the famous Draco dragon whistle. Simply blow through the mouthpiece, 
and the model dragon calls in imitation of a live specimen, inducing a response in dragons nearby. What do you know? The, the old... the dragon call. <laughs> it's like a bird call, but for dragons. And then over here we have... Classification by habitat. Given that dragons can fly, colonizing the earth has been easy for them. As a result, any dragon species may well be found in any region with the right habitat. European dragons, for example, have been known to inhabit remote areas in North America. This chart showing the primary species should aid identification in any area. And there's the knucker. This knucker sounds right. The Dracotroglodytes. <laughs> Man, you think English is hard. That's Latin, probably. Yeah, species names are in Latin. I know this. Who doesn't? So, yeah. The marsupial dragons in the forest. In the mountains, we got the European dragon, Asian dragon, the Tibetan dragon, the prairies, and the, s and the steep. Steepy. <laughs> uh, we have the Ampither Ampithery and I I don't know. <laughs> the Lindworm. Arctic regions we have the frost dragon. Desert savanna we have the wyvern? The jungle we have the the Oh wait, that was, was it the American one and the Mexican one? I don't know. And then we got more ads down here. I'd be lost without my compass soculars. Find your way to a pair near you. Compass oculars is crazy. I wonder if those are actually a thing. Like, did anybody combine co a compass and binoculars? Because <laughs> if so, honestly, I should. Don't get burned when you buy a hat. The latest thing, get Dr. Drake's heat-proof flame-away hat. He tested to 1,000 degrees for 15 pounds. So I think that's pounds. I don't know. <laughs> I can't remember the currency symbols. And, oh wait, I almost tried to look at the map. What? That's my favorite part. Here, let's have the insides of the page. Wait, up here in America, we have the Draco Americanus Tex. Then here we have the Draco Americanus Max. So those were the the ones over there. Mm, Draco Americanus Incognito. Cognito. Hmm. Here we got the marsupial dragon. <laughs> I love the idea of a dragon that's like a kangaroo. That sounds that sounds adorable. I'm not gonna lie. Got the got the Asian dragons. They look wormy. They look weird. I think this one, this one up here is a lindworm. Yeah. Where's someone with no arms? Oh, there he is. It's the wyvern. And that guy. I think that's, yeah, it's just the European dragon. That's the one in all the, the, wait. <laughs> that's the one that the knights fought. I can, I can be a wolf. Dragon Mountain in Tibet. The habitat of the Tibetan, I think it's Tibetan. I don't know. <laughs> I'm probably mispronouncing everything in this book. The habitat of the Tibetan dragon lies among the peaks of the great Himalayan range. Crossed at high altitudes by harsh landscapes and dotted with monsters. 
<laughs> the monks appointed Dragon Master from among their ranks to maintain good relations with the local dragon. We have the uh um, Hong Wei. I don't know. That's probably wrong. Uh, uh well it's spelled uh it, it's spelled with a W E I. I don't know how you say that. Anyway, that's remote temple. Yeah. Um more more words I can't pronounce. <laughs> Fukian? Prov province is located high up in the mountains. Famous for its waterfalls and cascades, it was traditionally home to four dragons that were held to be responsible for rain in the area and bring good luck to the people. That reminds me of that movie. Uh... Is Rhea in The Last Dragon? That movie was kind of mid. <laughs> it had cool lore though. Uh, the, Ketu the Katoomba in Australia. The blue mountains are named after an eerie blue mist that colors the whole landscape at sundown, once thought to be caused by twilight vapors emanating from so-called blue gum, um, ecalaptidae bit. <laughs> We can now affirm that this is, in fact, the smoke of indigenous marsupial dragons. Dragons with pouches like kangaroos. The, honestly, like, the animals in Australia are really interesting. Because they, like... I read about it in my, in my biology class. Like, they... They evolved like kind of separate from everything else because australia is really isolated that's why we have so many like marsupials there and like nowhere else it's really cool actually <laughs> they got those dangerous animals don't they too <laughs> it's it's dangerous out there the iceberg in greenland icebergs such as the one shown here provide ideal locations for frost dragons to build their caves. As the iceberg drifts southward, the dragon finds it has less distance to fly when the migrating season begins and it departs for the Antarctic. It's fun. The Lost City of Serpents in Guatemala. It is not known why Mexican amphitheories are often found near the ruins of jungle cities, such as this one in Guatemala. Perhaps they were once worshipped here as gods, or perhaps they played a role in hiding some of the legendary treasures from the Conquisitors. And this one at the bottom. The Castle Drachenlager in the German Alps. Alpine environments are perfect sites for, this, uh, for some European dragons who live in caves just above the tree line. Living among mountains, they can hide when necessary and specialized climbing equipment is needed in order to even attempt the study of these elusive creatures. That's pretty cool. Okay. Yeah, finally, we turn the page. <laughs> I guess it's been forever looking at this book, honestly. Like, it's so cool, and there's so much stuff on every single page. It's kind of wild. Okay. Chapter 2. Oh, that was just chapter 1. It's really short. It's <laughs> like two-page chapter. Uh, chapter 2. While it is likely that all of the western dragon species are closely related, the keen dragonologist will note a number of interesting differences between them. For example, while the rich flame of the European dragon is produced from a combustible venom, the breath of the knucker does not ignite at all. Frost dragon venom, on the other hand, sprayed in a mist through arctic air, has a corrosive action that is similar in almost every respect to the effects of frostbite. Ooh, that's really interesting. Look at that. This is a supposed specimen of a wing membrane of a frost dragon. Wait, listen, you can like... 
<laughs> it goes like yeah it's shiny very shiny let me see it right there. see very shiny but unlike most reptiles western dragons spend much time caring for their eggs incubated young di wait hold on <laughs> i think i skipped a word unlike most reptiles Western dragons spend much time caring for their egg incubated young after they hatch, and a firm bond develops quickly between chick and parent. That's so wholesome! Dragons actually care about their children. Like snakes. <laughs> snakes just lay their eggs and they just leave. <laughs> They're like, I'm gone. See, <laughs> see y'all never. It's honestly really cool though. I think crocodiles also care for their young. I saw that on wild crabs. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I can't imagine just laying an egg and then just being like, okay, bye. I want to go get the milk. <laughs> and the even crazier thing is that the babies are like, I might have just been born, but I know how to live now. So many animals just have instincts where they know how to do everything from birth and I wish I'd known how to d I'd wish I know how to do everything from birth. <laughs> you know, imagine being born knowing how to like do your taxes correctly. <laughs> My life would be so much easier, holy cow. No doubt, but there is none other beast comparable to the mighty dragon in awesome power and majesty, and few so worthy of diligent studies of wise men. Gildas Magnus Ars Draconis 1465. Well, that explains why the spelling is terrible. <laughs> Wait, I have a thing over here. Hold on. The somewhat perilous science of dragon dragon metricy dragon metricy metricity. <clears throat> Sorry, let me try that again. The somewhat perilous science of drag. I already failed. <laughs> or dragon measurement has few living exponents. <laughs> Uh, it does sound dangerous to go and measure dragons. Like, hey, dangerous, scary dragon, can I just hold you up to a tape measure real quick? <laughs> I want to see how tall you are. <laughs> However, we can assert that the adult wyverns are the tallest of dragons, standing some 20 feet or so in height, as may be seen in the following diagram. So here is a human. <laughs> He's so tiny. Tinier than my thumb. Yeah. Uh, here's the. I think that they didn't. Oh yeah, a human, B Chinese lung, C European, and here's the wyvern. The wyvern is the one with no arms, right? They look so silly. They look like chickens to me. Like they look like chickens. <laughs> I don't know what it is about them. It's like, wait. It's like, see, it looks like a chicken. <laughs> but anyway, it's getting off topic. While some authorities claim the Knucker is simply a junior form of the European dragon, that is almost certainly not the case. Indeed, its preference for damp holes in low-lying locations is in contrast to that of its larger cousins, which prefer rocky mountain areas. Also, although knockers do hold treasure, they attack with venom rather than fire. <gasps> oh, they attack the venom. <laughs> I hope you're finding this as interesting as I am, baby. <laughs> okay, good, 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 good. <laughs> this is this is one of the reasons I really like being with me, you, with me. <laughs> I, 
not with you is because you let me rant about all this stuff. It's it's nice to have people to show this kind of stuff to. A lot of people I knew before thought it was dumb. I don't think it's dumb. I mean, look at that dragon. I want one. I'm I'm my life will not be complete until I have a dragon <laughs> as a pet. I don't care what kind of dragon or what size. It could be tiny. I just want one. <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't know where you would find them if they're even real though. <laughs> I'll I'll keep believing. And maybe I'm coping, but it's it's fun to believe in things, I think. Knucker is Zoe lives around here. Like it's England, right? <laughs> yeah, it's England. <laughs> And like, yeah. I'm too American for this. It's Europe. That's what I'm thinking. Not England. I mean, England is in Europe. This England is there. I think I'm thinking of Europe as the word I was looking for. <laughs> eh. Can't be a nerd about everything. And I am not a geography nerd. I am not. <laughs> Knucker is found in damp woodland locations near food stores such as rabbit warrens, serpentine in appearance. These creatures have only vestigial wings and cannot fly. Yeah, he's got those little wings. Vestigial basically means that something is useless. <laughs> it's just kind of funny. Some animals, they just, they have stuff that's useless. I think we have stuff too, but I kind of forget what. Lair or nest, a deep pond, well, or knucker hole. Dimensions, they're 30 feet long, 3 to 6 feet high. Colorations, leathery brown, dull red, greenish blue. Forms of attack, venomous bite, constriction. Oh, they wrap you like a snake. They wrap you like the, like the boa constrictor. That makes sense. They do look like snakes. That's kind of what serpentine in appearance means. I'm just repeating what I read. <laughs> they eat rabbits, deer, farm animals, and stray children. This is why you do not leave your children unattended. Holy crap. <laughs> stray children. <laughs> and here's a knucker coming out of a well. I'm now scared of wells. <laughs> Would you let a dragon boa constrict me? <laughs> yeah, that's what I thought. You better not. I'm not a child anyway. I just had children. <laughs> what do you mean, but I'm small? I'm not that small. Come on. I'm not... I'm, I'm not, like, child small. You're being ridiculous, holy crap. Oh, and there's the, here's the key for the, the picture of the dragon here. Let's see. It's so, this is the European dragon. It makes sense. It looks, it looks like European dragon. The European dragons are like, the, like the most popular kind. They're the European dragon, the, the Chinese dragon are the most known, the most well-known. It's Chinese dragons probably more well-known in China. And then, you know, the European dragon in Europe. In America. <laughs> but, there's the arrowhead tail back here. And then we have, that is hardened for use in fighting. I always, it's an interesting thought that animals use their tail for fighting. I mean, I guess that's what scorpions do. <laughs> Where, where's B? Thick spines. Specifically thick spines. <laughs> we have the large bat-like wings. 
and Claude Talons. Um, scales. It's got, it's got scales. And the horns. It's got those little horns right there. And the fanged teeth. And the eyes that so providing a truly phenomenal sense of sight. Man, why do the dragons get all the good genes? I'm I have terrible sight. I gotta wear <laughs> I gotta I gotta pay the extra sub subscription service for the glasses. And glasses aren't really a subscription service, but I get like a new pair every year, and that's basically a yearly subscription if you think about it. <laughs> the Frost Dragon is in Canada, and uh, Greenland, and Iceland, and um, up there. <laughs> Annual Arctic to Antarctic migrators, frost dragons, fly thousands of miles each year to ensure that they spend the greater part of the year in their favorite dark winter climates hunting for food. Lair or nest, a sea-facing cave hollowed out from a glacier iceberg. And the adults are 40 feet long. They're big. Mm, 12 to 15 feet high. They're pure white or white tinged with blue or pink. Ooh, they can be pink. It's pretty neat. Forms of attack. Fearsome, frosty, blast, tail, claws, horns. Food. Giant squid, polar bear, orca, walrus, leopard, and seal. But don't worry, that one doesn't eat stray children. I mean, I don't know what stray children are even be somewhere that cold, but who knows? I mean, people live in Canada. <laughs> what am I saying? I was thinking of Antarctica when I said that. And then we get the description of the European dragon right here. Which, shocking as it is, is in fact in Europe. <laughs> Known to most people through their ability to breathe fire and their love of treasure, this species is now confined to a few remote areas. Effective at using language, what? They can use language? What? That's pretty dope. That's pretty cool. Uh, effective at using language, they shed their skins triannually. Okay. <laughs> I keep forgetting reptiles just kind of take all their skin off every now and then. <laughs> Man, they're just like take all the skin off so weird i've seen like a like a snake skin just lying around before i've seen snakes before too i want to see a big snake though i've only seen little ones i want to see like a big snake like a really big one but uh i met i've met a snake before once someone brought a snake to my school and uh it went on me and it went on my backpack <laughs> It was, it was fun. Uh, they are nest, a mountain or sea cave in a remote area. Dimension 45 feet long. So they're, they're the biggest. Then that one. And then, and then this guy. I like this guy, he's so silly. He's so silly. Well, now I'm scared of wells. It's fine though. Because I'm not a child. I'm not stray. <laughs> you won't let me stray around wells and... It, you know what? I'm gonna go... I'm gonna go alone to a well just to prove that I'm not a child. Because I'm gonna go to a well and I'm not going to get eaten. Because <laughs> I'm not a child and I'm not that small. I'm sure the dragon knows the difference between a child and a short adult. Surely, surely. Coloration, red, green, black, or occasionally gold. Ooh! So attack, flame, tail, claws, horns, food, cattle, sheep, 
humans, the last only if no other food is available due to the bitter flavor. Okay, so the humans don't taste good? <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> what do you mean by that, huh? <laughs> well, apparently they don't taste good. <laughs> no, 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 no. Stop. <laughs> Chapter 2 still? <laughs> Man, I'm never gonna get through this at this rate, baby. We're gonna be up all night <laughs> doing this, of all things. Of all the things we could be up all night doing. Why not talk about dragons? It's like the best thing. Well, we were reading about them, but whatever. It is interesting to note that while legends of western dragons portray them as vicious, bloodthirsty monsters, eastern dragons are for the most part seen as benevolent help needs to mankind. The reason for this most likely stems from the historical interactions that mankind has had with different species of dragon. Clearly, some have been better neighbors than others. Hmm, that's interesting. That is true. That's true. Some species of lung lay their eggs in running water. Ooh. The Tibetan dragon? Right here. Thinner and redder than its counterpart, the Asian lung. Which is over here. The Tibetan dragon is a lover of high altitudes. Its main prey is the Himalayan Yeti. So the Yeti's real too, huh? Hmm. <laughs> a large mountain ape that has adapted to the cold conditions in rare, rare fiend atmosphere. Rarefied? I don't know what that word means. On this found in the higher mountains. Lair or nest? On the open mountainside in the summer, in the shallow den of snow in winter, the adult is 40 feet long, 10 to 12 feet high, almost invariably red forms of attack, biting or else constriction. Ah, they do the old squeezing too. Seems like a really scary way to die. So no! One of the worst days, what days? One of the worst ways to die is to like suffocate. <laughs> it sounds painful. Biting or else constriction. Yeah, I read that already. <laughs> Food. Usually the large mountain apes known as yeti, sometimes yaks. Okay. I love a good yak. Um, here's the lindworm. For years, it was thought that the explorer Marco Polo's description of a lindworm was actually a description of a Chinese crocodile. The notion is quite ludicrous, as the beast he described had only two legs. Even a child knows a crocodile has four. I don't know, man. <laughs> Christopher Columbus thought America was India. I don't know how much I can trust his judgment. <laughs> Bro accidentally discovered a new country <laughs> and didn't even notice. We give him too much credit, I feel like. <laughs> Differences between East and West? Sadly, in the West, Mummer's plays enacting the mutilation and killing of dragons used to be fairly common events in Mayfairs. In the East, dragons are granted a proper respect. During Chinese festivals, they are often honored with dragon boat races and dragon dances, as shown in this scene, depicting such a dance in Canton in 1884. Let's go to the East for being nice to dragons. And then, what about the Lindworm? Fleet of foot as a wild pony. The lindworm is most often seen at a distance, 
sometimes in pairs, chasing its prey of wild Bactrian camels on the huge empty steps of the steeps steps it has an e at the end. I don't know what that's about. Of the Asian interior, lair or nest, a shallow scratch or nesting in the earth, out of the wind. It's thirty-five feet long, eight to ten feet high, usually green, pale orange, or sand yellow. It attacks with its claws. Constriction. Food. Bactrian. Two humped camels. Windworm sometimes menaces silk caravans by night. Okay. Here are the skin shed from the Asian lung. It feels very nice. Really. This one feels like more... I don't know how to explain it. It's like... Tickly. <laughs> it feels more tickly. Like it tickles me. <laughs> it makes my fingers feel funny. So here's the legendary Asian lung. I think it's lung. It's spelled like lung. But it's pronounced differently. They're really... I, you really can't blame me for incorrectly pr pronunciate pronounce pr pronounce pronunciating. <laughs> uh, maybe you can if I can't even to say the right words. Lung are most often found near rivers, streams, and lakes that hide their underwater layers. Females carry their eggs with them for safety, using the layers to store the pearls and opals they hoard away. The number of toes varies across the various subspecies. Hmm. They have a different number of toes depending on the subspecies. Yeah, here's the... The Japanese lung have four toes. The Indonesian have three. The Chinese and Imperial lung have five toes. I have five toes. <laughs> I do, honest. Lair or nest? Usually an underwater cave or grotto. Ooh, that actually sounds like a really, like, relaxing place to have a lair. I'm not gonna lie. 40 feet long, 20 to 15 feet high. They're blue, black, white, red, or yellow. Ooh, I think that a black one would be really cool looking. Um, forms of tack horns, teeth, and claws used defensively. No, oh, they're nice dragons. Food mainly birds and fish, particularly roasted swan. I wonder how they roast it. I don't know. I don't think they breed fire. I didn't say they did. Okay. And then here we have all the features. So we have. Here we have the long uh, whiskery feelers. They have whiskers. <laughs> and then we have stag like horns, the mane. So we have five toes on each claw here. Here's the egg. Usually carried in the four claw, have very large scales, right? The ones on the European dragon are small, they're very big. And then the feathery tail, oh, up here. Get like a feather on the tail, it's very cool. Um. Long associated with all kinds of water, Asian lung were seen as having power over rainfall and storms. It is likely that the four legendary Chinese dragon kings were highly impressive specimens. Yeah. And then here, we got a section on other dragons. So, here we got Apart from the primary eastern and western species of dragon, there are a wide variety of other species deserving of attention. Unfortunately, space is limited in such a wide ranging tome, and we must pass over to the pass over no not pass over to pass over the 
Um, gargoyle? Gargoyle? Oh, wait, gargoyle! I can't read. <laughs> the Naga and many others in deal instead with the most prominent dragons of Africa, the Americas, and Australia. Man, the American dragons got slumped into the other category. It makes sense. European and Asian dragons are clearly the coolest. Here's the wyvern. The one that looks like a chicken. It's found in Africa. Let me see. Africa. And then like... Other places. It's like the Middle East, right? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know anything about geography. I didn't do well in the class. <laughs> Let's do focus on my other more interesting ones. Yes, uh, just because I'm a nerd, that doesn't mean that I'm good in all subjects. Nobody is, unless they're just, I don't know. Unless they just only take classes they know they're going to be good at or something. <laughs> That's why you shouldn't feel bad. We all have our different strengths. I, uh, frankly, I don't care what your what your grades are or whatever or what they were. <laughs> grades don't really matter much anymore. Unlike most other dragons, the wyvern has only two legs. However, being the largest form of dragon, it finds these perfectly sufficient for carrying off its elephant prey. Bro, it eats freaking elephants. <laughs> That's pretty darn cool. I wonder what elephant tastes like. I, I don't know. Does anybody eat elephants? Surely. There are people out there for who eat the weirdest things. I'm not surprised anymore. <laughs> I mean, yeah. That, that is an example. It's not really what I was thinking, though. It, honestly, people eat the crit. Anyway. Um, Leonis, rocky crag, or occasionally a circular nest in an area of sand dunes or grass. Um, the adults are 50 feet long. Oh yeah, that's right, they're the, like the tallest ones, right? Um, to 18 to 20 feet, 20 feet high. Woohoo! Most, uh, no, sorry. Muddy brown to lime green. That's pretty cool. Forms of attack, teeth, claws, lashing tail, dropping from great heights, food, elephants, hippos, rhinos, or other large herbivores. Alright. The wyvern, two early geographers, Herodotus and Pliny. I've read some of Herodotus, it's actually really interesting. It's been a little while, but I have read Herodotus. He's a lot more interesting than Thucydides. Thucydides was honestly kind of boring. <laughs> Herodotus was really cool though. It's really cool, like, reading a history book written by somebody uh, from a long time ago. It's really interesting. Like, I, uh, I felt like I hadn't done that really that much, and then I read Herodotus. I'm like, wow, this is actually kind of cool that he is, like, telling me about stuff that happened a long time ago for him, and he happened a long time ago for me. <laughs> And he probably knows more about what happened a long time ago, because he, he's closer to a long time ago. <laughs> anyway. Herodotus and Pliny both mention the wyvern's taste for elephants. It is possible that the giant elephant-hunting bird of Arabian legend, the rock, was an early case of mistaken identity. Ooh, that's cool. It was a dragon the whole time. Um, so this is the, the one I can never figure out how to pronounce. The Amphithery, Amphith, Amphithery. So it has hypersensitive eyes. Feathery frill around the head. Has, um, it has no legs. It's got no arms and no legs. It's just a snake with wings. <laughs> and a cool tail. It's got a cool tail over there. Um, yeah, very large wings. Those wings are so big. Like, 
do a humongous um, and then it's got um, feathery tail No, I wonder what dragon feathers look like. So I've seen so many of these dragons that have feathers on them. And I want the dragon feather. They're cool. I like feathers. They're really cool looking. And their structure is like really interesting. Like, a lot goes into the structure of feathers for like aerodynamicness. I don't know what I'm saying. <laughs> But it's interesting, it's interesting. I haven't learned about them in a while. Uh, I learned about them in high school, I think only. But I remember being, like, it was really interesting when when I learned it. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I can't always remember the stuff that I found interesting, but I do remember that it, I did find it interesting. And that makes me more willing to, like, learn about it again. <laughs> we here. It's a specimen that... <laughs> The wing membrane of a marsupial dragon. Marsupial dragon. The kangaroo dragon. A very. It feels like. Um, it's like softer. It's not soft. I wouldn't say it's like soft. Is it? it doesn't have scales. It's just kind of. Yeah. It's pretty cool. The close. This. Sorry. This close up. Specifically. This one shows a reconstruction of what an empathier's foot may once have looked like. It is not known why the feet were lost, but modern day am amphithers use their serpent like tails to strangle and carry off their hapless prey. That's nice. Their feathers have sparkling golden appearance. Oh, that sounds so pretty! Sounds so pretty? If you found one, you did put it in my hair. All right, I wouldn't argue with that. <laughs> Note the tremendous gripping power of the original claw, now lost. Man, that's unfortunate. Wonder how they ended up losing them. So they used to have feet, and then they lost them. Hmm. I wonder if that, why that was selected for. The Mexican amphitheater almost certainly inspired the ancient Aztecs in their description of their god. I can't pronounce this. Um, Quetzalcoatl? No, that's not right. It was an attempt. I tried. <laughs> I tried. Okay, so... The amphitheater... In addition to the well-known Mexican feathered amphitheater, there is a furry North American variety that primarily hunts buffalo and has sometimes been mistaken for a gigantic moth. <gasps> it's fluffy! I want to see it. Um, they are nest among the reeds on lakeside or offshore islands. 45 feet long, 5 to 10 feet high. Um, they're green, forms of attack, flaming breath, tail lash, constriction. Food. All the large indigenous mammals of Americas, typically llamas in the south, buffalo in the north. Not the llamas. Not the llamas, man. Um, marsupial dragons. Oh wait, I miss it. There's a bit about... Phoenix is here, that I forgot to read. We'll read about the Mesopotamian dragons after the Phoenix. The Phoenix. Oh yeah, oh, yeah down here it says study of empathier skulls and reveals vested vestigial legs. You just have legs! Why did you lose your legs, man? That's unfortunate. It would have been. S I mean, you're cool without legs. But like. I don't know. I wonder how that happened. Anyway. Phoenix, the Archaeopteryx, something, something, fossils discovered in 1860 and hailed as the missing link between reptiles and birds helped many people to understand Darwin's origin of species. 
In reality, these fossils belong to a primitive form of phoenix, a bird that uses a highly effective fire bath in order to rid itself of parasites, and that is in fact the missing link between reptiles and amphitheers. Sadly, phoenixes are so scarce that until recently, there was thought to be only one in existence. Wow. A fire bath improves the phoenix's plumage so much that people thought it died and was born again. But it doesn't actually? That's sad. You mean to tell me it doesn't actually die and born again? And I've been scammed. I've been lied to my whole life. Uh, okay, now we read about the kangaroo dragons. It is interesting to note that marsupial dragons are found not only in Australia, but also in the Pentag Patagonian region of South America, half a world away. How did that happen? How did they get over there? There are a number of other marsupial creatures that have been discovered here too, that exist somewhere, that, that exist, sorry, <laughs> nowhere, it's the opposite of somewhere, nowhere else in the world. One might almost speculate that Australia was once attached to South America eons ago, if the notion were not so preposterous. Huh, I had, I'm, if it happened to a lot of other mystical just too, I wonder what that was about. It's interesting. Very, very interesting. But, what, do they just go, well, I'm, I'm gonna go to, um, you know, I'm gonna go to freaking... In South America now. So like, I don't care about all the ocean in the way. <laughs> Just gonna go to South America, you know? Be great. As yet, little is known about the vast Australian interior. It's fair. Oh, powerful hind legs evolved. The wings shrank. Oh no. Look at those tiny wings. They're so tiny. The marsupial dragon rears one young at a time in the fiery pouch. My gosh, I completely missed it. There's a baby in there. How did I miss that? There's a little baby in there. Isn't it cute? That is adorable. Okay. Um, so. Marsupial dragon. Thought to be extinct, the marsupial dragon is largely confined to southeastern Australia. It breathes blue smoke and often starts bushfires so that it can catch its prey as they are driven before the flames. It lives in rocky caves in the Blue Mountains. Wait, what word is this? Eucalyptus forest? Eucalyptus. Duh. <laughs> I can read, I promise, baby. 25 feet long, 15, 18 feet high. These ones are actually like pretty high and long. I mean, they're not very long actually, but like they're close. And I mean, they are a lot higher, like proportionally to the rest of them. Coloration, green or bluish, forms of attack. Flaming breath, lashing tail, kicking feet. Boxing fists. Did they do kickboxing like kangaroos? <laughs> that's that's what you didn't know you needed to see. A couple of marsupial dragons kickboxing. <laughs> Food. Any large marsupials, smaller prey are sought while rearing young. Makes sense. We gotta get the the little food for the kids. <gasps> chapter three. Finally. Been on that chapter for forever. <laughs> Here's this one. This one's really cool. This one has like the anatomy or whatever. Very, very cool. The natural history of dragons. Dragon biology and physiology. Yes. Most species of dragons are reptilian and share many features of this animal type, such as egg laying, although they also care for their young. Like they should, you should always care for your young. <laughs> Maybe this society could learn <laughs> from dragons. <laughs> yeah. 
Anyway, they are unusual in that they are the only creatures that can speak with meaning apart from humans. They can talk. This is in fact true. I really wonder if you could have a conversation with a dragon. That would be amazing. I want to talk to a dragon. However, not all dragons have managed this feat, and it seems likely that it is only the older, more experienced dragons that have developed the skill. I need to find me an old I need to find me an old man dragon. <laughs> we can we can have we can have a, like a conversation together over over a nice over a nice stray child. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, oh, uh, I mean, the dragon could eat a straight child, I guess, as long as it's not me. Because I'm not, e I'm not even a child. I would keep saying that, like I am not. <laughs> but I'm cute. That doesn't mean I'm a child. <laughs> and I'm not that small. Gosh, you're so mean to me. Oh. Laws of flight say that dragons, like bees, can't fly. It's always interesting to me. Laws of flight say that bees can't fly. And the bees are like... <laughs> we don't obey the laws of flight. <laughs> Gravity? What is that? That's funny. <laughs> there, yeah, dragons, like bees, can't fly. When in actual fact, they can. Their aerial skill is assisted by the dragon's ability to bend its wings and rotate them quickly in their sockets, and also by the fact that dragon bones are lightweight and hollow like those of birds. Look at those wings. Shad wings be like. Oh, that's the fall book. Maybe be like. Whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. Um, in this picture, one can see how the surprisingly bat-like wings of the European dragon are fixed with small fingers, which can be used to aid the dragon in climbing sheer cliffs, by extension tall buildings. That's pretty cool. Fingers. And then, over here, got the anatomy. So here... We have the horns, the teeth, the scales, arrow tail, clawed talons, thick spines. Okay, then. Wait. <gasps> Muscles. So, there's the spin spinous habitus. The latissimus. <laughs> um. The Latissimus Dorsi. Yeah. Um, did I say deltoid already? I don't know. Pecto pectoralis Major. Yeah. Dragon Pex. <laughs> the Rectum Abdomin. Abdominin. Abdomininus. <laughs> Look. I, I'm, t I'm just glad that all the lab practicals I've ever taken were not oral exams. <laughs> because I'd be dead if I had to pronounce it. I mean, sometimes you don't even have to spell it right. A lot of my professors were like, you know, if, if you can, like, if you can, like, say it. I mean, not say it. If you can, like, write it in a way where if you said it, it would sound the same, like, you're chill. <laughs> So here's the brachiodalialis or something. A dorsal interstitial <laughs> gluteus minimus. Okay, and then here we have a thing. Um, the muscle structure of the dragon is similar to that of a large lizard, which certain features that are more common to birds. The large muscles at the base of the wing are not needed so that the dragon is able to gain enough force to fly. Sorry, I read that backwards. They are needed! <laughs> I was gonna say, what do you mean they're not needed? They are needed! So, <laughs> so that the dragon can gain enough force to fly. Man, I can't read. <laughs> the large muscles, yeah, I read that already. 
However, there is no con consensus consensus on how dragons actually are able to fly. We kind of have this thing down here. As they do not share chief aerodynamic features of birds, namely their lightness, a certain amount of wing rotation may enable creatures to attain a degree of lift. But if one were to view a dragon a priori, as though it were a theoretical rather than an actual model, one would inevitably conclude that it was as likely to be able to take to the skies as the heavier-than-air flying machines currently being experimented with by the obscure Wright Cycle Company in America and the contraptions of the eccentric Frenchman Louis Bellarive? I can't read. <laughs> Man, whoever's writing this book, like, oh yeah, those Wright brothers, they're crazy. They can't make us a fly. Well, I mean, if the Wright brothers can fly, maybe dragons can fly. <laughs> Wait. Is that it? No, that's what I thought. We got direct skeleton. Look at that, it's beautiful. Here's the skull, here's the ribs, the scapula, humerus, that's where the funny bone, <laughs> the ulna radius, the phalanges, the tarsal, the metatarsal, the femur, tibia and fibia, ileum and ischium, caudal vertebrae, let's go that tail, the phalanges up there too, also phalanges up there, interesting. Both the toes and the wings are phalanges. So it says, the skeletal structure of the dragon is largely similar to that of other vertebrates, backbone creatures. Interesting difference are those concerning the European dragons having both two wings and four legs. Unlike birds, the dragons ha the dragon has no large furcula or, or wishbone upon which the powerful flight muscles can be attached. Instead, a note may be added here about the common mania for paleontology. In this so-called science, <laughs> whoa, we throw in shades at the paleontologists? In this so-called science, huge calcified bones are unearthed, along with claims that they belong to some kind of extinct uh, super reptile called a dinosaur. The author will not test the, cred the credulity of his readers by dealing with such fantasies, but will merely comment that, were these bones to be real, they could not be those of long dead dragons, so skeleton found generally do not have wings. My man doesn't believe in dinosaurs, but he believes in dragons. <laughs> Alright, let's see here. And then we got this page. They're between Eastern and Western. By comparing this Chinese dragon skull with the European skull below, the differences in the uh, essential shape of Eastern and Western species can be seen. Dragon bones are not often found because they're very fast rate of decomposition. Probably because they're really thin. Oh yeah, there's a European dragon skull. Very different. Sight. Dragons have the best sight of any animal and were sometimes slain, so their eyes could be used in telescope lenses. Oh, jeez. <laughs> Just let me have your eyes for my telescope. <laughs> like, hey knight, can you go kill a dragon for me? Why? I gotta, I gotta make a telescope. Okay. <laughs> That's crazy. It may be that Galileo used the dragon lens in his very first telescope before realizing that fairly good lenses could be made by great glass. <laughs> That's funny. I'm just go, wait a minute. I can just grind glass. It's so much easier than getting somebody to kill a dragon for me. A dragon can spot a valuable gem from 6,000 feet. 
That's crazy. Dragon's eye has six optic nerves used to see light in different parts of the spectrum. <gasps> Wait, can they see, like, other light? Because I know there's, like, a lot of light, and we see, like, a very small portion, you know? Like, uh... You know, microwaves are light, like the microwaves, they run on microwaves, wow, and they, that's a form of light, we have like x-rays, and there's just like ultraviolet and infrared, oh no, ultraviolet and infrared, I can't, I'm mixing up things, ultraviolet and infrared, which are like just outside the visual, the visible spectrum, I know, uh, infrared they use in like TV remotes, it's interesting. I remember one time I was looking. My uh, my brother had like this spy goggle thingy growing up, and he we could when we were wearing this that, and we looked when my parent turned on the TV, we could see like the red line. It's very cool. But um, that's getting off topic. <laughs> I just wonder, because I know birds, I know some birds can see, I think, ultraviolet light. And that's how they can tell, they can tell each other apart pretty well. It's because they can see, like, they have patterns in ultraviolet light. I just saw that in my textbook randomly. And I was like, oh, that's so interesting. And I want to read more about it, but, like, mm, there's so much stuff I want to read more about. The scales. The hard scales of the dragon are capable of resisting most projectiles and can be made into bulletproof armor using metal rivets. Claws are made of keratin, like our own hair and nails. Dragons must avoid breathing fire on them or they stink horribly. Huh, that's interesting. I didn't know that happened if you burned keratin. Hmm, <laughs> very interesting. Feeding and digestion. Digestion is fairly straightforward in dragons. In general, a dragon will eat its prey whole when this is practical. If not, practicable, not practicable. I don't know what I'm saying. If not, the dragon may rip its food into tasty chunks that are small enough to eat. The dragon feeds once every few weeks. Once every few weeks? It's so crazy to me some animals, they just eat like once a month or whatever. <laughs> I'm over here eating three times a day. <laughs> I probably look like a freaking hobbit to them. Like, what do you mean, third, three meals a day? I eat three meals a year. <laughs> That's probably an exaggeration. I don't know if any animal eats three meals a year. Maybe three meals, uh, three meals a month. Um... Sometimes, when a top specimen is eaten, or one with a hard armored exterior, the dragon will regurgitate its prey at leisure in order to shell it and flame grill it to a more succulent tenderness. That's nice. Alright, so, here's the outside of the head. We have the horn, got the ear, the eye, the nostril, primary fang, Tongue, jaw, throat. Dragon's fire can reach a temperature of 1,000 degrees. Celsius or Fahrenheit? What? A s 1,000 degrees? What? I don't know. I'm gonna assume it's Fahrenheit because I'm American. <laughs> How dragons breathe fire. Essentially, fire breathing is made possible through adaption of venom glands, such as those commonly found in cobras or asps. Asps sting. I touched one before. It hurt. It kind of felt like a jellyfish. Like, it felt similar. It was really weird. I've been stung by jellyfish, too. I'm actually allergic to jellyfish. I figured that out. Because you know what happened to me? Is I, I was at the beach, and I got stung by a jellyfish. And then, like, a week later, I had, like, a really bad rash everywhere I got stung. It was so weird. So, yeah, I'm allergic to jellyfish. <laughs> but they feel like asps. I'm not allergic to asps, though. Anyway. As with these snakes, dragon venom come from two specially adapted teeth. 
or fangs. Dragons who breathe fire secrete a piece of flint and a piece of iron pyrite in a special pouch in their mouths, juggling them to produce the sparks to light the venom. Explanations involving methane gas, gases or iron teeth are unscientific nonsense. Yeah, that would definitely hurt your teeth, but it's like, it just goes that way, so it's not really like, in the teeth. Okay. Here's the Venom Reservoir right here, and here's the Spark Pouch, and it says, Like the teeth of most reptiles, the dragon's teeth are constantly replaced by new ones as the old wear away through age and use. Wait, they get like a lot of teeth? No, that's not fair. People get like, you get two tries. You get your baby teeth. And then you get your teeth. And then that's it. <laughs> you don't get any more teeth after that. You don't even start with like a full mouth. Because you get like... Let's say you have your... I think you have your 6 year molars, your 12 year molars, and your wisdom teeth, right? So you get like 3 extra molars that you didn't have when you were a baby. And if you're like me, you got your wisdom <laughs> teeth removed. So, dragons have a life cycle that resembles that of lizards. Although they actively learn some aspects of their resulting adult behaviors when young, unlike most lizards, whose behavior are innate, their, gust their gestation, sorry, not gestation, that's eating. <laughs> gestation is the, like, being in the, in, in the... Becoming a baby. Wait, no. <laughs> it's like, you know, when they're, yeah, when they're getting ready to be born or hatched or whatever. Becoming a baby. It's, that implies that you, you're something and then a baby. And you're like, you're a fetus and then a baby. <laughs> but, um, anyway. This then implies un unborn babies aren't babies. And I feel like we typically call them unborn babies, but they I digress. Dragons have life cycle and resemble that of lizards, although they actually learn some aspects of their resulting you know, when, when young, unlike most lizards, behavior is innate. Okay, I read that right. Their gestation process may be best studied by rearing dragon chicks, but these creatures must be released into the wild at maturity. Not into New York's sewerage system, as occurred in one case in 1862. Wait, what happened in 1862? I want to know what happened in 1862. Man, they put them in the sewers <laughs> in New York? That's crazy. Someone should make a movie about that. That would be interesting, actually. Uh, you know what? What am I saying? I should make a movie. I'll be the person to make a movie about it. Just watch me. Oh, here's a dragon eggs. Your pin, knucker, frost, wyvern, and empithier. I can never say that one. Oh. The dragonologist hatchery. If you can obtain the eggs, you might like to hatch your own dragon chicks. To keep the eggs warm, you need to make a nest of live coals which must be kept burning over the gestation period of three years. Whew. Three years? It takes them three years to hatch? That's crazy. It didn't even take me a year to, to be born. That's... It's like, nine months is like... three-fourths of a year? over here like yeah three years I mean just imagine having to keep up with eggs for three years and not have them break or something that's crazy I assume they live long with the, that long a gestation period though it's normally how it works normally if you stay in the pre-birth longer you stay in the after birth longer <laughs> Um, 
sorry. A small sledgehammer may help them hatch, and if you are present, the chicks may believe you are their parent dragon, usually increasing your chances of survival, surviving that all-important first encounter. Yeah. I just, it's interesting though, like, I know birds, birds, like, impress on people, right? I just don't know how you could be like, ah oh, yes, this creature that's not even, like, the same, like, I'm trying to remember how far up birds are, like, divided from humans. Not even the same kind of animal as me. I'm like, yes, this, this is my father. This is my mother. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You say so. Can't imagine being born just the first thing I see. I'm like, you are my mother. <laughs> A dragon's nest. Dragon's nests need not be soft. For dragon eggs are highly resilient. I'd hope so if they're gonna be around for three years. But m it must be warm. However, the eggs retain heat very well. Generally, a nesting mother breathes a jet of flame over her eggs over every three or four hours. Lindworm and wyvern pairs share nesting duty, whereas only female European dragons care for their nests. Man, the male European dragons went to get milk. That's sad. And over here we have rearing infants. Dragons enjoy tasty treats, plus in a whole chicken. Keep an adequate food supply, a 40 to 50 acre farm with a head of 300 cows should be enough for one chick. That's a lot of land and a lot of cows for one baby. Small treats such as turkeys, dogs, cats, mules, or geese may be used as rewards for all important house training as the chick learns that setting fire to your home is not acceptable behavior. Good dragon, you didn't set my house on fire. Here, have a whole goose. <laughs> oh my gosh. Maybe I don't want a pet dragon. <laughs> no, I do, I do. I'm just joking. I do want one. I won't get a baby, though. <laughs> Maybe I just shouldn't get a baby. Signs of growing maturity. Although it might actually be easier to have a baby than an adult. There are a number of behaviors that show a chick is nearing maturity and will soon seek to leave the nest. No, don't leave me. Hoarding. The chick collects precious objects from around the house, reluctant to return them. Fire play. The chick seeks out iron and flint objects and plays by making huge showers of sparks. You're going to set my house on fire doing that, baby dragon. That I I don't know why I'm talking to a baby dragon, there's no baby dragon here. <laughs> Language. Chicks repeat any words and phrases they hear repeatedly in a parrot-like fashion. Horny behavior, often misdirected towards inappropriate objects, such as this penny-farthing bicy bicycle, is seen in chicks from an early age. Okay, he's, got, he's got the bicycle. Points to remember. Keep iron and flint objects away from chicks or live in a fireproof house. <laughs> Do not release your young dragons into the sewage systems of large cities. Mind your language around chicks. They may repeat what you say over and over in front of visitors. It is not recommended to leave children and hungry dragons alone. <laughs> Hide all shiny or valuable objects. Man, baby dragons sound like a handful. <laughs> I thought baby humans were a lot. I'm never going to complain about having to babysit ever again. <laughs> so I'm not babysitting a dragon. Although, babysitting a dragon would be so much more fun. Oh. Ah. Come on. Open. Hatch. Egg. There we go. <gasps> it's a baby! And then, and then, it gets bigger. Is it green now? Wait, is it? Yeah, it changed colors. It's pretty cool. And then we have, in the third stage, an egghorn develops to aid the chick in sh chipping open the hard shell. 
Oh yeah, here's the egg corn right here. <gasps> Look at him, he's so cute. Or her. Wait. I don't know. And here it is. It's the hatched baby. At birth, the horn and tail differences between male and female chicks are in evidence. Here's the male. And here's the female. What do you know? How to estimate age. Dragons are difficult to age. They shed skin by or triannually and grow certain amounts every year, so it is possible to make an estimate from their size. Sometimes the dragon's memory of historical events can help. Dragonologists estimate a lifespan of about 300 years for a typical European dragon. However, no one has any idea how long the Chinese lung live. Well, that makes sense why they have a gestation period of three years. They live to freaking 300 years. If we, if we had gestation period of three years, would we live for 300 years? I don't know if I want to live for 300 years. I feel like a human lifespan is a good length. Not too long, you know, but not like incredibly short. Like some bugs live for like a day and they're like, well, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> That's incredibly sad. So, yeah, some some bugs life cycles are basically I'm alive. I laid an egg, now I'm dead. <laughs> and it's been like a day <laughs> or two. <laughs> it's crazy. So lifespan. It's a human, we have seventy years. Um, Knucker, those for 120. The Amphitheater, those for 250. Europeans for 300. And the Chinese is just unknown. Someone's got to figure out how long the Chinese dragon lives. That'd be a pretty fun research project. Okay. Man, I didn't realize how late it's getting. Shoot. You tired? You look tired. Okay, okay. Look, it's almost the end of the chapter. I think. Yeah, this is chapter 4. Or IV, if you want to read the Roman numeral. So, we'll finish this chapter and we can look at this later. <laughs> no, it's okay. Don't apologize. Uh, I don't want to keep you up too late. <laughs> you look tired. It's alright, it's alright. We'll get some sleep after this. The natural history of dragons. Dragon behavior. <gasps> my favorite thing. Behavior. Maybe not my favorite thing, but behavior is really interesting to study, actually. The behavior and feeding habits of dragons have evolved to enable their survival as a species. They share most of these traits with other animals, but two unique habits are dragons' love of hoarding and their ability to speak human language. While there are many theories that relate to the dragon's hoarding imperative, so far no one has found a credible reason for their linguistic abilities. I'm just impressed I said linguistic the first time <laughs> correctly. Tame behaviors. As a result of their interactions with humans, age and lung have been known to exhibit tame behaviors. They are quite ready to accept the gift of food, provided that it is of a suitable quality and some Chinese temples have a monk whose primary task is the preparation of succulent meals for the local dragons. Um, in preparing a meal, only the very finest and best ingredients should be chosen. Who is the dragon eating food? Uh, courting behaviors. Oh, like the bower birds of New, uh, New Guinea. Yeah, remember that. The male dragon woos a female by creating an elaborate nest decorated with treasures selected to please. Frequently, as can be seen below, the male will attempt to gain favor with his bride by presenting her with particularly choice gemstone. The larger species seek a mate every 28 years or so. <laughs> every 28 years? 
That's crazy. I mean, imagine only looking for a mate every 28 years. So here's the dragons. He's like, I have this cool gem, what do you think? <laughs> anyway. Um, the hoarding behavior of dragons most likely evolved because dragons have a soft, unarmored Achilles spot on their bellies. When they lie on treasure, some of the jewels stick, providing them with protection in their one vulnerable area. The dragons who evolved this hoarding behavior were the ones who survived. Those who did not are no longer with us. That makes sense. We, like, we got the got the gems there. Um, this area of dragon language, sorry, this area of dragon behavior is a mystery. They are the only creatures apart from humans who both speak and, when occasion, when occasion demands, write. Dragons write? I want to read a book written, not wrote, written by a dragon. Particularly interesting is the western dragon's well-known taste for riddles and language games. So here's the dragon script right here. <gasps> Found carved on an old oak near Lambton Hall, England. An old stone tablet found upon Oak Island. So there's these writings. I could translate them with this key, that would take forever. Ooh, it goes this way too. The Chinese believed the secrets of writing were gifted to the Emperor uh, Fu Huzai? I'm pronouncing that wrong. By a dragon from the Yellow River? Perhaps the origins of our alphabet, too, lie in the ancient um, the foothark runes that deck the walls of hidden caves or the tops of necker holes scratched out by the dragons themselves. Maybe the alphabet was adopted later by the Norse and transformed by the Greeks and Romans. A tantalizing possibility. Be crazy if we learned how to talk from dragons. Language exercises. Dragon script is most often written in the local human language. Dragons are reluctant to write in their own tongue. These fragments of dragon scripts are taken from English speaking areas. Real fragment found with broken stone tablets. And the whales. Yeah, and then we have these. Okay. It says, like tigers, weak or old dragons who cannot hunt their usual prey may become man or rather maiden eaters. This is because maidens are more likely to wear jewelry containing favorite dragon gems such as rubies, emeralds, amethysts, or diamonds shown only red. Oh yeah, here's the gems over here. We have ruby, emerald, things, the amethyst. And the diamond. This is why you should never buy expensive jewelry. <laughs> Alrighty. There's still quite a lot left in this book, but I think we can go over it later. Because there's still quite a bit. New tired. No, 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 no. Don't apologize, baby. Thank you for thank you for letting me show you my book. <laughs> um, I wouldn't have expected us to go through the whole thing in one night. It's long, <laughs> but I do really appreciate that you're willing to let me rant about my interests for so long because it's like my favorite thing, and a lot of people uh, they just. Uh, they wouldn't, they wouldn't do it with me, so, like, they wouldn't listen, they thought my interests were dumb, or whatever, but, you're willing to listen to me, and that means a lot, like, I don't know if you fully get it, how much it means to me, so thank you. <laughs> what, what do you mean I'm cute when I get excited? It's, 
I mean, thanks. Most people just think me nerding out about stuff like this is kind of dumb, but... I guess I can't assume that you're like everyone, because you're not. So, thank you. And now, I think, oh, we need to go to bed. <laughs> Come on. And you better brush your teeth, okay? <laughs> That's kind of important. Go brush your teeth. <laughs> I'll see you in a minute, baby. Mwah. <laughs>